The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Welcome everybody. Nice to see everybody. So I didn't think there was going to be so many people. And hello YouTube. Nice to see everybody online. <laughs> Uh, indeed, uh, we're building a Newbury Monastery there and I'm uh, sort of in charge, uh, which is, I don't think, it, um, it's going to be an interesting year ahead of us. We, um, we just got tenders are coming in now and we've been doing a ton of work to just do the paperwork. It's been a, a big hassle, but luckily we have beautiful volunteers helping us. I mean, all it takes, very few people, you know, very involved. So. If you ever want to get involved, please please do. But remember that if you if you do get involved with uh, even volunteering somewhere, that it's good to commit yourself. So don't. Whenever you do something, do it with your all your heart. So it's like as monks, we are uh, involved with everything we have. We give our uh, our families, we give our money, we give everything. But we get so much. So. It's a great investment for the future to build monasteries, and it's uh, great if you can get involved, even if you just come and feed us in the monastery. We, we greatly appreciate anybody. It's a, in, it's a very beautiful place we have there. It's cold, I must say. I, mean, I come from Finland, and I, I consider the, where we live now cold, so it must be pretty cold. But um, what happens in Newbury, it's, it, we're quite high up there, and yeah, once you, if you come and visit, please just come and visit us. You can see we are above the tree level, and you can see, really see a long distance, and the winds are just ferris over there. So here, and even Melbourne, you, you last few days you felt cold, but we, we were putting a fireplace on, and, <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it gets pretty cold there. So we're building now, and one thing we're really taking in consideration is that making make sure that the uh, the buildings are going to be comfortable for the Sangha. We want to have a stable Sangha there and if, if, if we're going to save everywhere we can and the heating or anything like that, it's, it's not going to be comfortable and the monks, monks don't feel comfortable there. So, I myself, I, I feel that I still want to go back to Perth, unfortunately. I'm here to help the project and I do the best I can. I, I feel I'm helping not just the monks, but there's going to be there's a beautiful sangha of nuns there already, and it's it's a one it's a rare opportunity for anybody of you if you consider that. Buddha always said that the give is to give to the the whole sangha. The dual sangha is the highest merit, and there's not a lot of places where you can do that. You can give to the dual sangha. You can give monks and nuns. The monks we everywhere. It's easy to find us. There's difficult to find nuns in this world, and I there's a there's a need for them as well, there's need for nuns. And it really is a high benefit that we, we are training now nuns over there. I'm, the nuns obviously train themselves, the monks, we are just trying to support them and uh, help them in any ways we can over there. And Ajahn Brahm, our spiritual director, he's been such a kind person and raising funds for all of these projects and he's got a lot of leverage these days so he goes all over the world and if people ask him where to donate he's, a, he's got another project now in England but obviously I'm here now so I want to promote our place and uh, for all of us Melbournians and the, it's an, if you think what's an investment for the future, obviously monastery is a great investment it's, a, it's never going to go wasted so that's a great thing. Monasteries, we, if anything, monasteries tend to accumulate things and monasteries tend to go bigger and bigger and bigger. But in the beginning, it's always tough to get it going. So now the investment is going to be hopefully lasting many, many years and we're going to have uh, very well-trained nuns and hopefully there's going to be new sangha of monks coming there as well. And if you think of what's a, what the investment for the future, for yourself, in investing in the future is obviously it's your spiritual growth. If, you, if you're thinking of something where it's money in the bank and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to save for the future, I'm going to be uh, my, uh, my uh, superannuation, what not. And you, people are, you're always thinking of that or you're trying to make sure you're always healthy and I'm going to be like this when I'm older by I'm exercising, eating good food. You just don't know. That's the thing about life. And that's why we have monks and nuns to remind you uh, all these things. What's important in life? 
it's not that you're going to be secure for the rest of your life. You plan everything is going to be perfect, and you 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 look into the future. This is why, how I want the future to be. And the reality is, you don't know. This life goes on, and the nature takes over things. In 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 Buddhism, we believe in this thing called karma. I can hear it being thrown out, this, you know, kamma all the time. And, you know, oh, it's my kamma to do this, especially in our circles, or Buddhist circles. And for me, I don't really like that idea too much, because for me, it's a bit too religious. And if you would know my background, I'm definitely not a religious person. I'm, okay, I'm a monk, and people, people think, you know, they look at me, it's like, oh, he's a religious person. I'm not. I really don't consider myself as a believing many things. And that the, that's the great thing about Buddhism. Imagine as a monk, I don't, I don't really need to have that, com that much faith. Sure, the longer I've been in Buddhism, the longer I can see it actually things working, and that the, the, the Buddhist teachings, um, they do make sense. But that's how it should be. It shouldn't, it, the teaching should be that they make sense, and you can actually validate them in, in the real life. And, it's interesting, people say quite often, it's like, oh, it's easy for you monks to say that we, we teach about this, like, oh, meditate and, you know, just have calm mind, have kindness and all that. And, oh, you know, I get abused in, in lay life all the time. My work is so difficult and people are tricky. They, they talk nicely on the, in front of you and then behind your back they abuse you. And it's true. I mean, I was part of that 10 years ago still. And I was part of a very hectic life. I, I wanted to be very successful. And everything I did, I always tried to put the, the most effort I could. Even if, I, you know, I was a chef at one point, and I, I always wanted to be the top. So I end up working in the high-level restaurants, in what you would say, five-star restaurant, which is nonsense, I see now. All of that kind of stuff is absolute nonsense. But I felt that, you know, that's where the human thing that we, we always need to aspire somewhere. And now I see the like the food, I, I, it really took me a lot of effort to, even when I was coming out of it, the last thing I did, I was construction engineer, but I always had that kind of thing when you have certain kind of training. And with the, with the training of being a chef and being in a high level, you're always very critical of everything, all the food you eat. So you become this food critic all the time. And it's not a good place to be at. It's like you, everything, even I was in a monastery, and in the for early years, I would look at the food and it's like, well, you know, it's, it's nice, but, well, you know, it's not very perfect, is it? You cannot compare mom's cooking to the, you know, it, you go to this expensive restaurant. And that's not the point. Moms don't cook to have the perfect meal. The moms cook because they want to have the very nourishing meal for their children and their, their family. And the same people who bring the you know, food for the monks and nuns to the monastery, they want to bring the best food because they're thinking, oh, what, what I can make for the nuns and monks, what would be good for them? Okay, it's not the perfect cut. It's not maybe the salt is missing, maybe the season is a bit off. But, <laughs> Nowadays, I look at the food and I find so much gratitude from the food. I change my perception. And that's another thing that Buddha actually thought that way. And that I can see that when I actually put the effort in changing the perception, I, I'm starting to think wisely what's important about this food. It's not that it's perfect, but it's the, the, the actually the idea of giving, the what's behind that. That's important. And that's what creates karma. Karma is the thing what comes from your mind state. So you put some, you do something, and you do it out of kind heart. Okay, it didn't out, turn out perfect. The dal burned a bit, and I forgot to put the salt into the chicken. And but you still came from the kind heart. And the people who are receiving that kind of gift, they feel that gift. And not even if they don't realize that they sort of cringe like, well, the doll is a bit too spicy today. <laughs> you still feel that you did the best you could. And by doing that, the effort, the idea, the idea behind your action created the good karma. 
not what came out of it. That's what you have to remember with things like this. So, okay, we're building a monastery now, and it might turn out to be the worst disaster. We're going to go over more than the, the federal budget for building the railway system from the Melbourne city to the, uh, the airport, which has been planning for, what, 30 years, and it still hasn't happened. Who knows? I might be here 30 years talking to you. We need to raise more funds. We are right, but we're getting close. It's this never going to happen project. And I, well, I hope not. I really want to end this project in, and go and meditate in the forest in beautiful Bodhinyana monastery and stay by myself in the, in the forest uh, in Akuti. But who knows? But the idea behind what we're doing is we're, the, we're doing the best we can at the moment. We're really putting a lot of effort. We've been doing so many contracts and, you know, and Shire is giving us stipulations and the water authorities are giving us hard time. And, but I, our idea is that we try to make the best monastery we can with, these, with the money we have and with the, effort, with the volunteers we have and all of you. And that's going to create the best place. Not that we have government giving us $10 million and we can just build everything perfect and ev everything is going to be perfect when you come there. I'm, I'm, I can assure you, you come there a year's time and you look, this is it. Where's the rest? Um, but the fact is that we know as a monks and nuns, and Ajahn Brahm knows it, he's just said, go ahead. You know, we were like really not sure. Even we have this fundraising gala dinners coming and oh, we really weren't sure, should we go ahead with this? And people are maybe not coming and we should have planned it more. But Ajahn Brahm just said, don't worry about it, just go ahead. Sometimes you have to take the leap of faith. Sometimes we have to have thinking that if we do something out of, you know, positive energy, we have enough faith and kindness to do something, it will turn out okay. And even, even if it tur doesn't turn out the best, this is even for your own life, when you have to decide something. But you know you're coming from a place which is calm, which is kindness, instead of coming from a place of anger, you want to revenge for somebody, then that creates good karma. That will create the good future for you, in the sense that when you look back the, the decision, whatever you had to decide in life, should I divorce my husband? Should I continue with my husband? Should I, you know, change my school? Should, whatever it is in life, we have all these decisions we have to make. But if you come from a place of calm, I'm doing the best I can, you do put all the effort, you put the, all the information you can into the place, and then you make the decision instead of having a revenge for somebody. Uh, then, even if the decision turns out wrong later on, but when you look back to, into it, that wh why you decided this, you can see that I put all the right things in place. Even if you think later you feel that, oh, it didn't really turn out that good, I maybe should have gone the other way. But you can't really punish yourself. You cannot kick your own backside too much about it because you did the best you could. That's a good thing about remember about karma. And that's that's sort of like that's I I like that idea. And for me it's not faith anymore then. I'm not a religious figure then because I believe in something like that. I can I can see that in that oh should I commit a suicide? Well, I just wait until I'm in happy mood and then I decide. Well, then if you still think you, you know, the euthanasia is the best option for you, well, maybe that's when you can do that then. At least you're not doing it from the place where I just want to end this, you know, this is, I don't want to do this anymore. So I feel really, really good. That's why that I feel great that we have places like monasteries where we, the monks and nuns, we can come to practice. We have people like Ajahn Brahm, who's been living in monasteries, been supported by everybody. Ajahn, and 
that's the thing we have to remember, that monasteries are built for the Sangha. There is monks and nuns there who you don't know now, who, not, who are not so famous like me. We have all the nuns there, young nuns who are training now in the monastery. But it's same like Ajahn Brahm. I like that story. In, in early days, Ajahn Brahm was living in Wat Papong. And obviously, Ajahn Chah was the famous monastery, that time, uh, famous monk at that time in Wat Papong, Ajahn Brahm's teacher. And some, sometimes, the, you know, the food in early 70s in Thailand was just, Ajahn Brahm said it was disgusting. It was absolutely, he was not used to eating, you know, frogs and, you know, sticky rice. And that's what it, you, you survive on that. He seriously was malnourished. You can see the pictures of those monks and there was nothing there. And once he said there was this, you know, a lot of people came and he saw, they, they knew they're coming from uh, Bang Bangkok. And wealthy people, and they started putting all this food out. And they put all this food out in Wat Papong. And, all the, and obviously monks started to get big, a bit excited. Oh, there's going to be some good tucker coming in today. It's like, oh, it's going to be good. No frogs and rice today. Maybe we have some nice pork curry. And people come out, one person comes out of the car and says, oh, is Ajahn Chah here today? And the, the, the junior monk said, no, Ajahn Chah has gone to house, Dana. And they just pack up their food and left. <laughs> what? Like, I mean, like, what? How can you do that? Imagine like you're waiting, you month on end, you eat frogs and rice, nothing else, and then somebody comes and then there's like, well, you, obviously these monks don't deserve it because they're not as famous as Ajahn Chah. But uh, nobody would do that for Ajahn Brahm these days. He would, uh, oh, it's like you would come there and it's like Ajahn Brahm would be waiting there and people, you know, is Mudito here? No, he's not. Well, okay, well, we take our food back. <laughs> it, it, so that's what you have to consider. The Sangha is it's not, it's bigger than any monk or any nun. Sangha is bigger than that. Sangha is all the monks and nuns, not just here, but everywhere in the world. And while building these monasteries, we are building places for the Sangha. The Sangha is bigger than Atom Brahm. We obviously, we all have a, a huge respect for somebody, for some of these famous monks and, you know, for the Buddha. But if nobody supported him, he, Ajahn Brahm, wouldn't be around. If nobody supported Ajahn Chah, m maybe we weren't around. What keeps me going is just the kindness of you, everybody of you bringing us food. And th coming back again, I find so much joy and happiness out of that, uh, out of the overspiced dal in the, in the Monday morning, because that keeps me going. And not just that it's the best, you know, uh, restaurant food. I, uh, you know, obviously, I, you know, it's once in a while, it's nice, but who, who wants to eat restaurant food all the time? Your mother's cooking is way better. And, and I don't tell my mom, but my mom is not a good cook. <laughs> but I still, you know, I still miss my mom's cooking just because I got used to it, the uh, potatoes and meat. That's what we ate. Obviously, she was busy, so she didn't have too much time to cook, and so I feel grateful for her to supporting us children when we were young. But those are the things what you have to remember. What you know, the monasteries are there for you. Monasteries are there to keep the Dhamma alive. And if we don't have monks and nuns, the whole Sangha there, Buddhism will, the Dhamma will disappear. And if we don't have laymen and lay women like you, the Buddhism will disappear. If there's nobody there to respect the monks and nuns, if there's nobody there to give an ear, to listen to the teachings, then there is no Dhamma, life, Dhamma anymore in this world. We don't think in Buddhism, that's another thing which I like, that we're not a religion, or I don't have to have faith. Buddhism won't survive forever. It will disappear. Obviously, of course it will. If none of you come here today, if there wouldn't be any monks and nuns in Melbourne, you would be lost. I would be lost. I wouldn't have anywhere to go. Maybe I would get <coughs> fed in, in some of these Thai restaurants. I, I could always find pindapad food. But we all benefit from these things. 
not just us monks and nuns, but for, for all of you. And Dhamma will disappear in the world. At the moment, we're doing well. I can really see Australia is, that's why I'm in Australia. That's, it's not just Ajahn Brahm, obviously. It is, I came here to ordain because of him. It's, people ask, why did I come to here in Australia from Finland? I could have gone to Asia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, many places. But I felt that I, I find a perfect teacher here. And when I came here, I noticed this Himanga support here in Australia for the for monasteries and for the monks and nuns. And then there's a really a lot of interest for Dhamma. And so that's it's really inspiring. And I think uh, always remember that's that's something you take with you. This is a karma you're creating now. You're creating interest. Buddha gave this beautiful simile, which I repeat quite often, is if there's a tree in the forest and the tree has a lean, the, the tree will always fall into the direction of the lean. That's just the, you know, the way of how it works. So, and what the simile is pointing towards is like if you are, put interest in your life to certain things, which, whatever you, you put the lean into, that's where it's going to fall. So if you if you try to find teacher which you feel in, you you feel inspired from, and try to find once in a while put a bit more effort in putting into meditation, maybe do a retreat or uh, do daily practice, do chanting if it inspires you, read the sutta or read the mapada, something like that. Listen to some teacher, and that will put the lean into the tree. Why did I become a monk? I come from northern Finland. I come from really a rural background. I'm a country pumpkin. I, there's nothing there. There's no Dhamma to remind me. There was, uh, there was no internet, obviously, when I was young. I, I, there's no access to that. And even then, over the years, of course of years, I went from place to place to place and end up in New York and li listening to somebody like Ajahn Brahm and reading the suttas. And I felt that, oh, I found it. It was like coming home to me. Suddenly I just felt that, oh, this is it. I, I've been looking for something and something now makes sense. And once, when something makes sense, you go for it. You cannot turn back. And I remember quite often people also ask, why did I become a monk? And I really don't have answer, but in, I remember in early days when I was a monk, I, I, I thought to myself, I, I wish I could forget. It's too difficult for me to be a monk. I, it's, it was so difficult in the beginning mm -hmm. to keep going, to give up um, all my life. And, but I felt that I have to do it. But at the same time, I was thinking, I wish I could forget. There's something in the Dhamma that, where it says that there's no self, that I'm just, I'm just heir to, the, to my own actions from the past. I'm just... I'm just repeating the, what my, my family taught me, my father's father taught me, my mom taught me. I'm just, I'm just following these uh, this foot, uh, footsteps. But I, I wished I would have some kind of uh, self-will there. I wish I could do something on my own, but suddenly I realized I can't. So the only thing I can do, I just, I just have to follow this, the track I have now. And Hopefully my karma is good enough so I can stay as a monk for a long time. And then again, when the tree will fall down, it will fall down for all of us. It will fall in the direction of the Dhamma. But I don't know. That's the, that's the tricky thing about also about karma. You don't know how it, it comes to fruition. That's what you always have to keep in mind. That that's the, what, the, what's the reason why we, what we end up for the Nibbana? Because everything is too unpredictable. If the karma was such that you would always do something good and the, 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 it turns out good. Well, it's easy. It's, you know, it's almost mathematics. Nobody would ever want to do anything bad and you always reap the benefits. You're always going to higher and higher places and you end up in these high heavens. And, you know, and that would be the reward for the good karma. But it doesn't work that way. There's another simile Buddha gave about you know, a karma. And he said, you know, it's, kama is like a, it's like a stick. So you have the heavy end and you have the light end on, uh, on the stick. If you, if you throw the stick up in the air, 
obviously it should come down usually with the heavy end first. So if you, you know, if you do good, obviously you should be happier. Obviously you should, your life should be easier. And you, you give money, you should, you know, you know there's reasons why something, somebody come to Buddha for some, uh, quickly go to another simile. Why is somebody wealthy? Well, they were, they, they were very giving in their previous lives. They gave a lot of dana. They were a giving person, so they feel that they, they can attract money. Why is somebody beautiful? Because they had a lot of meta loving kindness in their life, so they, they're beautiful because of that. And why is somebody smart? Because they ask questions. So going back to the, another simile now, into the, with the stick with the two ends. So the stick always has the two, both ends, the heavy end and the light end. If you've been a good person, giving person, have a lot of metta, all these things, you should reward the happiness and the kindness and beauty. But the, the reality is that you throw the stick up and, and it might land with the light end first. You just don't know. It's too complicated. There's too many things interfering with your karma, too many things with nature. A lot of things are not even karma, a lot of things are just nature. Nature takes over. You get, you know, get blown by the storm and you die. That's, that's nature. You get in a car accident, it's not your karma, it's just nature. You get put a monkeys behind the wheels and accidents happened. So that's the thing we have to remember. There is, you want to put the lean into the, into, the, into the tree, but you still have to remember that karma is too unpredictable. But we still always encourage. If you want to be happy, if you want to do, uh, feel light in your, in your life, you, that your heart feels uplifted, giving is always good, being kind to others, but the, you know, not just others, Kindness always starts from yourself, and that's what you have to remember things like practice, like metta. You always start from yourself. That's another big thing I've been teaching, and I can see a benefit for myself. Not a, not a faith. Loving kindness, compassion, all these things, it starts from, my, from yourself. That's, you, you have to remember that. We don't uh, to put the other person first. We always have to start the kindness from yourself. You learn it from outside. So metta practice, as far as I can understand it, somebody, some other people might think the other way, amongst and nuns. But you should learn the, the feeling from somebody you really feel that loving kindness. So learn it from your grandmother, from your mother. Usually those are very good things. Somebody like that, where you can feel it really easily. Your little dog. Dogs are really nice. We had a dog as well. And, and I remember when I was young. And you know, I can really feel that, you know, very lot of compassion for the little dog. And you can learn the feeling from that person, animal, nature, whatever you can learn it from, and then you translate for yourself. But you, yourself sort of comes first, but you learn the feeling from the others. That's why you start from person which is really easy to have the loving kindness towards, and then you transfer it for yourself. But we should first do a lot of time to ourselves before we can go start going into further steps for you, you know, for your loved ones, for you person you you don't feel so you know it's quite a neutral person and then you you know you go towards enemies and the universe it's very easy to do this kind of guided meditation that you don't people always I don't feel anything well obviously not because you don't have the kindness the meta to, to yourself it hasn't even started you have to put the, in practice all the time kindness toward yourself and I, I like Ajahn I, I um, Nisarno actually taught it here, and I thought it was a beautiful simile. He said, if you don't have money in the bank, you can't give. If you don't have meta in your own bank, meta account, there's not much you can give. If you're not kind towards yourself, tolerant, accepting your own things which you, you do, well, you're not going to accept others' you know, misbehaviors and others' uh, 
uh, in intolerance and others things uh, the things others do to you because you didn't have enough metta for yourself first. So remember that you have the money in the bank and the practice has to come. And it's really nice because it, 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 we always feel like oh, I shouldn't like myself too much. I shouldn't. We sh you should. You should accept yourself. That's how, where it comes from. That's really the key of the practice. And when you start being kind to yourself, you can be kind to others. And I've noticed in just even very concrete thing for myself, because my health is not the best. I have some problems with my health, but I don't usually want to talk about it. People always, there's going to be otherwise 10 people coming to me like, oh, I know how to cure you. And it, it causes too much stress for myself. <laughs> So I, I, just, I just say that, you know, I have always had like weak stomach and, and because of that it causes me other problems. But um, the thing is, I've noticed that when I allow myself to be sick, allow myself my stomach to upset again, and I can just say, oh, that's okay. It's, it's, it's not my fault. It's, it's nobody's fault. It's, again, it's nature. It's, maybe it's my karma. Most likely it's not. Most likely it's just, you know, the, these things come into play and I just, I just happen to inherit this kind of stomach. And so I learned just to be relaxed at it, be at ease with it, don't fight it, uh, fight it. And same thing I used to have when I maybe would have to give a uh, public talk or I, you know, just before exams and from the school, when you're young, the school, there's so much stress for the school. I used to grind my teeth all the time. And quite a lot of people get that. We have these places where we have stress. Maybe it's your jaw, neck. Quite often you have, you know, tight neck. For me, I was stomach and my jaw. Definitely I can see the stomach gets upset. My jaw, I, I used to always grind my teeth just before, I, like everybody says who used to sleep in the same room or my mom, that I'm grinding my teeth before, just before I was falling asleep. I don't know why, just before you, sleep, you fall asleep, you start, you just, your jaw start tightening up. And I actually have grinded off a lot of my teeth, less, quite a few of them are broken because I grind them so much. But I learned to actually just Notice that, be aware of that. And just that noticing that, being aware of that, I learned to relax it. <sighs> That's okay. I can feel that tension coming. That's all right. And just that thing, it, it, you can see it further and further away, and then you stop going that way. And I haven't cried in my teeth now for years. Since I became a monk, probably the first year as a novice, I, I, the good thing about being a monk, we have so much more time. So I actually had a lot more time to just to relax myself. And when I go to sleep, just actually notice that. Just awareness, the noticing. That's the, that's the, uh, the mindfulness, what everybody's teaching this. It comes with wisdom. You, and you, just that awareness, mindfulness, it's a lot easier you drop it because then you know it's there. And quite often it's good. If you have somewhere tension, chest is another place where you feel tight in your chest and your, in your throat. Actually notice the place and have, you know, have a physical, just touch it, the place. And then you learn to notice that. It's, your chest is tightening up again when you have to do something. You have to travel, you have to do public talking, whatever. You feel it tightening and you can actually or there's something coming, panic attack. Quite often people say that it's, it, it manifests in your chest. You can actually just physically just relax it and you know, massage yourself and that's okay. You know, I can feel this coming again. And when you learn to do this, the, the, money, the, the mind and the body are connected in that sense that the, whatever is in your mind, it's manifest somewhere in your body. And that's mindfulness as well. That's the body awareness. <sighs> okay, I can feel the tenseness coming up. I, I don't want to go to the public and I can feel it's coming again. Well, notice where it actually is, the actual place of the tension and learn how to relax that. And these are just basic, simple teachings of the Buddha. People, 
we have high teachings which aim higher and higher. Where you meditate, you drop into jhana, into nimittas, jhanas come, wisdom comes. But a lot of thing, a lot of times, I feel that these the basic teachings of the mindfulness, kindness toward yourself, importance of gratitude. Uh, all these things are, they are the fundamentals. This is fundamental Buddhism, and it's Buddhism where you can actually hear, see it now in action. If you come to me again and say, oh, good for you, you know, you're a monk, you can do that. Well, I tried my best. I, but I feel that all of these things, actually, they are applicable. They are something you can take with you to the real world where monks and nuns, we don't maybe live, but we're happy not to live in that real world. We're happy to be in the monasteries by ourselves and see the seasons passing away and see our uh, life just going by, but that's, that's our job. And we try to do the best we can to keep the Dhamma alive and practice it to the best we can. And that's why we have monks and nuns coming who are good monks, famous monks like Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Shah, the Buddha, enlightened ones, because we have places like that. And then the, we can share it with you guys and you can share the inspiration with us as well. So I don't think I have too much more to say. And if there's any questions, I can take questions. Very good. Uh, Bhante, you spoke <laughs> about karma and um, the, the part it plays. So when does that um, take over our inclination, our decision to mm. do something. I mean, how does that affect uh, mm. a person being good or bad or uh, neutral or whatever? Mm -hmm. it is? Can you explain that to me? Thank you. How does the so how does karma work? So you saying uh, yes, over our decision or our inclination. Mm. So somebody Sorry. is going to be very good or somebody is mm. going to be very bad. Where, where mm -hmm. does the karma uh, the come or one come thing into you, it? One thing you have to remember: karma or karma, as you say in Sanskrit, um, it's an action. So a good way to translate it is it's, you know, karma, action. So when, or work, the, you know, the, the Buddha remember the, when his father was plowing the fields and he was sitting underneath the uh, uh, rose apple tree and he says, you know, I was sitting and that was the first time he got in, in jhanas there. But he was saying, you know, my father was plowing the fields and he said, you know, the word for that is kamman karoti. He was doing the kamma. So it's like you, you, the action you're doing now is you, what you're creating your kamma. The result you're getting is the vipaka. So you, the results, so let them, you know, the money, the benefits. So the karma works in, in, in my limited understanding, uh, in a sense that, in a way that it depends where you are coming from. So there is no really nobody there. That's the, the, it's so, but we still have to pretend it's there. We still sort of making decisions, but you are just, something is pushing to you to a certain direction. The only thing you can really do is just to try to have positive attitudes towards whatever it's pushing you towards. There's not much you can do. You still think you're in charge and you, you have a really strong sense that I'm doing, making this decision, even though it's not almost decided. It's the, the karma is too strong, the action, there the, is something in that ship which is already going to that direction, you think you're in steering it, but you're really not. But you are, tr the, you are try to create a positive attitude, whatever you do, the actions, see where you're coming from. And then when you come from a you know, kind heart, when you come from, try to come from a place which is soft and even, then you don't create karma, which takes you when you have to regret that I said that, I did that. All of these actions, so you create, that's how you get good karma. The, the, the first two verses in Dhammapada are the ones where the Buddha says, you know, everything, your mind is the forerunner of all things, your mind is the chief. If you, if you do something with bad intentions, that will the, the the sorrow will follow from that 
and it's it's just like the the wheel of the you know the ox which is pulling the cart and the second the in the perverse for that is does you know the mind is the forerunner of things all things mind is to achieve whatever you you do if you do come from kind heart from a good from peaceful mind happiness will follow you like your never departing shadow and i like that simile in the sense that if that whenever you have, if you have a mind which is peace, actually peace, peaceful mind, somebody like Ajahn Brahm, the happiness is always with him. It's like your shadow. It's 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 always there because you know you're doing good things. You're just trying to come from the best heart, and that's what you know. Purifying your karma, you can't really purify. The only thing you is try to have kind attitudes, attitude to the decisions you make. You can't really, you, 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 you know, there's the simile that like the salt in the cup of water. You, you, you put a spoonful of salt into the cup of water, you will taste it. But if you put it into a lake, it is, you, you cannot even detect that saltness there. Sure, in that sense, if you do good, uh, you know, more and more and more, the salty things you've done are going to be, you don't taste them because you dilute them in that sense. But karma is a really, really difficult topic. And one thing I like that it's, it's uh, also, you have to remember that it's like colors, it's like black and white. There is never going to be, it's very difficult to do karma which is pure, just pure karma. So you give from pure heart out of non-self, I'm just giving out of, I'm not expecting anything in return, I'm just, just you know, giving and coming from the place of non-self, it's not you know quite rarely happens. Quite most of, often you mix it with a little bit of black. You're still giving, giving because you want to give and be a good person. But there's still the person there, which so that's the drop of black into that you know pure karma, you know a little droplet there because you still feel that you uplift yourself and it you know you feel like you want to tell somebody that I give you know I'm I give monastery or you feel that you want to reap you know there's going to be future benefits coming that but you you know just remember it's always good to do peer you know the peer peer things like giving and kindness and letting go and start from yourself like I said start from yourself really really have to do that you know accept yourself and be kind towards yourself and also towards your actions. But the tinge of black is there. So don't, you know, don't beat up yourself too much, but still try to purify yourself. Yeah, yeah. So what, what I'm understanding is that our actions really uh, is partly karma, partly our decision, our inclination. Mm. That's what I'm understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, intention, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Bhante, this is another difficult topic. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned euthanasia briefly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it's something a Buddhist should contemplate. Uh, I mean, I ask this because I have a Buddhist friend who's in a lot of pain and mm. she started talking about euthanasia. Mm. Uh, definitely, I don't think you have to push it away. I, quite um, useful um, meditation object is uh, awareness of the death. Um, and I do it, it's quite automatic for me to, uh, it comes quite automatically for me in the sense that I think it's like, well, I will die. How do I want to live the days and the hours and days which are in front of me? They're passing so fast as we know. And every step you take is the, like the Buddha gave a simile, it's like the dog going to, um, cow going towards the slaughterhouse. Every step you take is towards the slaughterhouse. And so it, it, you know, it stirs up the energy. You don't waste your time. And euthanasia, in, it's a bit different, different, a different topic in a sense, but I mean, Ajahn Brahm is very supportive of it. And I don't see any problem with it. If you come from the place of calm and you, you understanding, it, you know, wisdom, it's not a suicide per se where it's just you know, decision of I'm coming from, I just want to end this, or punishing somebody, something. Whether we should think about it more often, I think comes quite automatic and, you know, for us Buddhists. And I just talked recently, a friend of mine who's uh, worked in the hospice system for a while and 
he said that the one thing what got him interested in Buddhism was that he felt that the people who were Buddhist they passed away easier, that they didn't struggle so much. So he he said, no, I saw there's something, something was there, and he said uh, that got me interested in Buddhism. What what do these Buddhist people have? So he he came to the monastery recently, and he just so it's quite interesting. I, but uh. I mean, in this case, it's hypothetical because um, the laws that are coming in in Victoria mm. uh, are quite restrictive mm. and, and she couldn't, but she's actually sort of wants to take that on. Yeah, I, I can see the, why, the, why they're afraid of it, yeah, why they have to put the strict laws in. But, uh, yeah. And the regarding, yeah. regarding euthanasia, does, I have heard that when... Is the microphone on, uh, Richard? Is it? Yeah, you sort of have to talk like okay. this. That's the <laughs> not yeah. used to that one thing. Yeah, never yeah. mind. That's the, mm, the I have heard uh, in somewhere yeah, that when um, Buddha and all the Hatan Vahanses, when they want to... Um, I can repeat it anyways. <laughs> when they want to, the Buddha and, uh, wants to. When Buddha decided to... Um, attain Nibbana, mm. Or mm -hmm. it was his decision. Yeah. So is it a kind of uh, thing? It almost is like that. So I, I don't know if everybody heard, but she's asking that if it's like the Buddha, when uh, when Buddha passed away, he decided that's it, it's enough. I've I've lived 80 years, my my body's failing. Uh, there's 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 not much I can give anymore. He said I he relinquished this life force. Is that a suicide? Well, Ajahn Brahm said it's all it is almost like that. It's almost like a euthanasia. Buddha. He the, he said that he could have kept going, that you know there's things there like thousand years, but that you know that's a bit. We think a lot of those things came later, but Buddha k did keep his life force going. He said he you know he almost died, but he said you know he, he by beer will he said I'm, I've kept going the last last few months, and it, then he said oh, I'm going to give up my life force. Well, that's it, is that euthanasia? I guess it is. The Buddha didn't want to keep going anymore, and you can see it in pe same people. You know, once there's no hope and they feel that that's enough, they they go. Um, so I don't have any problem with that idea that even the Buddha uh, committed suicide or gave up his life force or you know he. I don't. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that, and I do believe that. Yes. But yeah, it's an interesting topic, sure. Ajahn Brahm is quite nice that he talks about it quite often. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just a quick one. Mm. I, I thought uh, I heard you in talking about karma separating natural events from karma. Ah. Um, uh, it's a struggle to get one's mind around things to understand fully. I always wondered, uh, considering that we are made up of the elements of the earth and the universe. Mm. And in a way, if you take climate change, our, our action and the way we live contributes to climate change, as well as there are inevitable forces in nature, and they combine together in causing what's happening mm. for us. Mm. So when one talks about conditioned living, I had the impression those conditions uh, referred to a whole lot of forces that are in the universe mm. created elsewhere and created by our own volition as well. And mm. they combine and the effect uh, is a, as a result of the combination mm. of both things. And that's what makes it unpredictable or for us not to understand it. Mm. It's one of those topics where it really takes a more experienced teacher than than me, but the and um, uh, the karma is so difficult and it's so complex. But I like those ideas where Ajahn Pramali, my other te good good friend and good teacher, teaches me that um, it's quite often it's not people think it's um, you know these things happen to you and it's your karma. Quite often it's just nature. I like that idea that it's nature, biology. There's a lot of things Buddha said, it's not your karma. Many things which you, 
It's it's just causes and conditions, and it's it's not your that your previous actions put these things in rolling, and then you reap these the benefits or the 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 bad things out of the or the the previous actions. It's your actions are still very minor skill, very small things which you think you can affect. There is no Buddha never talked about things like group karma that a group of people can you know feel the you know effects of the karma that's never mentioned anywhere i remember i remember when we had the tsunamis in sri lanka and thailand and then all of all of a sudden they started to appear these uh, some teaching teachers who said about oh it's the group karma that they were supposed to be there at that time and that place and all that and it's just nonsense it's it, or, or I, I don't know. It's nonsense. Maybe that's a strong word, but it's absolutely not mentioned anywhere in the Buddha Suttas. Your karma is if you think about your own your own actions and the 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 tiny little things you can do in your life, those which create the way. It's almost like your habits. Your habits tend to keep you going. If that's another you know interesting way I look at karma that it's your habits. When your habits when you when you have a certain habit, you just keep repeating your own way of doing things. There's not much you can do about it, but that's your karma. Your karma is your habits, and the only way to change that it's not to it's to look at them differently, change your perception, just accept them. That's the way you change your karma, and see how can you see how you know small your karma. Uh, you know, climate change than would be. It's not really your fault because you're just coming from your own habits, which weren't created by you, anyways. Mm. But uh, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm the ugly duckling, you know. And when you know the the monks are, monks and nuns are the soaring in this beautiful uh, V shaped, you know, like the the geese in the in the sky, and I'm I'm suddenly out of air and I'm trying to get air underneath my wings and I'm cannot get flying because I'm out of the flock from Bodhinyana and Ajahn Brahm is there at the, in the front one you know taking all the pug, pugs and teaching everybody and us we can just like we look beautiful but we just behind him and it's easy to fly but I'm you know I'm out of there's no wings underneath my the wind underneath my wings yet here so I, that's another reason I feel that I, I, I need to go back to it soar into the higher grounds and we'll see yeah okay all right um i think we're gonna call it a morning it was nice talking to you i i think i got lucky today i went all right um <laughs> um sorry, sorry, sorry. thank you for coming see you again <laughs>